everybody, welcome back to the video series that we're doing on some home cured charcuterie today. We took a Boston butt and at first we broke it down to some different parts. We're going to be making a dry cured copa, a whole muscle cut, and we're also going to be making a dry cured salami today. Now what I wanted to explain in this video is a little bit of charcuterie 101 and 201 about why it's safe to eat what we're making today at home. So the things that we're going to be going over in this video are the different chemical compounds that we're going to be using in order to do the curing process effectively and safely. Also the industry standards that would be used if we were in an industrial meat setting and also the ways in which that you're going to be able to tell if your product is safe to eat. So what we're going to start out with is just a simple explanation of the different chemicals that we're going to be using in our sausage today. Now all of these are things that are found in nature. They're all made in factories where they synthesize these ingredients out of natural, naturally occurring things. So the first thing we're going to use, our most important thing in curing, is our salt. Um, so what this is going to do is that salt is going to interact on the cellular level with our meat. And meat and everything in nature wants to achieve equilibrium. Now what this salt is going to do is it's going to draw moisture out of the cells and it's also going to put that salt into the cells. Now what that does is it preserves the meat and it also makes it safer for us to eat. The other things that we're going to be using, we're going to be using dextrose here, which is a simple sugar. It's similar to the sugar that you have on your table sugar. It's a simpler form, meaning that it's easier for bacteria to, to digest. Um, the other, the last ingredient that we're going to be using is curing salt number two. Now this one is from Butcher Packer Supply, so it's called DQ curing, curing salt number two. It can also be referred to as Instacure number two, Prog powder number two, Cure number two. Any of those, the number two is the most important thing. The name before it is just a proprietary thing based on who's manufacturing it. Now the difference between this cure number two and pink salt or cure number one, which some of you may be familiar with, is the addition of sodium nitrate in this cure number two. Now let's go over briefly what cure number one is and what it does. So in cure number one, that is a mixture of salt and sodium nitrite. Now what that does is, if you're familiar with it, what sodium nitrite does is as it interacts with the meat, that sodium nitrite converts to nitric oxide. Now that nitric oxide goes into the cell, and on that cellular level it bonds to the myoglobin and present it in the meat. Now what myoglobin is, is it's the part of the cell that's responsible for that nice red color that we see in fresh cuts of meat. Now what the nitrite does is as it converts to nitric oxide and binds to that myoglobin, it changes that color to a nice stable pink. Now if you've seen a nice slice of ham at the store for lunch meat, you're familiar with that color. That's cured with sodium nitrite. Now what that also does is it gives it that nice hammy flavor that we associate with smoked meats, hams, bacon, Canadian bacon. These are all cooked products that are not ready to eat, meaning you need to cook them again like you wouldn't just eat a slice of bacon, and those are cured with sodium nitrite. Now what we're using in our dry cured sausages at home is the salt number two, which has the additional ingredient of sodium nitrate. Now you can think of this salt number two as a delayed release antibiotic capsule. If you took a regular Tylenol, it would instantly dissolve and go into your bloodstream. If you take a delay release Tylenol, it puts some into your bloodstream at first and then the other part slowly breaks down and extends the release period of that drug. You can think of sodium nitrate as the same thing. So what it does is that sodium nitrate has to take the additional step of converting into sodium nitrite before it then goes to nitric oxide and bonds on the cellular level. So what this does is it extends the amount of curing time that our meat is going to experience. Because we're using up to two to three months on our copa, and around two to three weeks on our dry cured salamis, we need that extended curing time. Sodium nitrite by itself or pink salt just wouldn't cut it. By the time that the curing process would be over, your hanging and drying time, that nitrite would have been processed by the cells by then inside the meat, and it would be gone. It wouldn't be ensuring that the chemical makeup of our meat is inhibiting the growth of bacteria throughout the whole process. So that's why we're using cure number two. Now the other thing that we need to talk about is why is our meat safe to eat? Now we, I went over in the beginning that there are different measurements that the food industry uses. They use moisture protein level, which was the standard up until a few years ago, until we switched over to water activity. 
Um, water activity was always the European standard. It's a little more expensive to test for, which is why the United States and the USDA were sticking with moisture protein content, but they've now switched over to water activity meters. Now, if you can buy one online, if you can afford it, that's great, but we'll be going through some cheaper alternatives to figure out if your sausages are safe to eat today. Now, if you, you think about the water activity, the reason we measure that is that in the cellular level, the bacteria can only grow and thrive in a wet environment. So they need that water in the cell in order to reproduce and to spread throughout your product. So the different things that we're going to be doing are trying to reduce the amount of free water that's in that cell. The way we're going to do that is through adding dextrose, our simple sugar, adding our salt, our sodium, and also adding our cure number two. All of those chemicals are going to penetrate the cell because as we know, everything wants equilibrium. They want to have an equal amount of salt on the outside as on the inside of the cell. So that cell is going to suck the salt and their different chemicals in and it's going to extract water. Now as it's doing that, if we're taking those places where the water was free in the cell, where the bacteria could grow, we're then replacing it with these compounds. So we're reducing the amount of free water, reducing our water activity, and therefore inhibiting bacterial growth. The next step that we're going to be using, we're using a three-pronged approach. The second step of that is just the simple act of drying our sausages up. That's why we're dry curing. We're putting them in an environment where the humidity is controlled, and by controlling that environment, we, we are using that same process of equilibrium to make sure that the meat inside is drying out. Now, if you think about it, as our sausages dry, they're going to lose moisture. The amount of meat itself isn't going to be reduced. The amount of salt and sugar that we're putting into our processes aren't reducing. The only thing that's being drawn out of that meat is the moisture, as the water on that cellular level. So we're using the replacement of different compounds into the cell. We're also using the drying, using our equilibrium effect to draw that moisture out, and that's reducing the amount of active or free water in the cell that allows the bacteria to grow. We're talking about botulism here. Primarily, you're also talking about trichinosis or staphylococcus. So those are the bacteria that can grow, but through these two first steps, those are the most efficient things that we can do in order to ensure that our salami and our dried cured sausages are safe to eat at the end. Now the last thing we can talk about is a lactic acid starter culture. Now what these are is they're a, they are a positive bacteria that we're introducing into the meat. I personally don't use one. I think they add too much of a tanginess to the meat, but if you're using a, something like a Thuringer or if you're making a pepperoni, that tanginess is welcome in that flavor profile. Now what these bacteria do is they feed on the cells and the sugar that's in those cells. That they're also going to feed on the dextrose that we're introducing. Now as they feed on that sugar, they're converting that into lactic acid, and what that does is to lower the pH. Now if you remember from your chemistry classes, water has a pH of 7, pH runs from 1 being the most acidic to 14 being the most basic. Now what we want is to lower our pH, therefore making things more acidic. Now what that does is it inhibits bacterial growth. If you think about a jar of pickles, they're stored in a vinegar brine solution, which is a mixture of vinegar, a low pH solution, a high acid solution, and um, excuse me, salt, which is also working to maintain and preserve those cells. So we're working with the same process if we're using the lactic acid starter culture. We're using that bacteria to create lactic acid and continually lower the pH of our sausage as it's going through the curing process, further creating a barrier to bacterial growth. Now is this absolutely necessary? No. I personally, like I said, I'm not going to use one of these recipes that I'm demonstrating to you, but you can use one. If it makes you feel safer, it will create somewhat of a safer product for you. If you're nervous about bacterial growth, if your cure chamber isn't as precise as you'd like it to be, use a lactic acid starter culture. It will make it much safer for you to eat your final product. Um, the other thing, stop. we're talking about these processes to inhibit bacterial growth and ensure that what we're doing here at home is safe to eat. The last thing that I like to do is to create a mold layer on the outside of my sausages. Now you see the same exact principle used in making camembert or brie cheese. What they're doing is they're introducing a positive or a friendly mold, one that we can digest easily, onto the outside of those cheeses. And what that does is it creates a protective barrier where that mold, which is very aggressive in its growth, 
grows faster and crowds out bad bacterial strains or bad molds that can form. So what I like to do is to scrape off, I buy a salami at the store or I take one from my cure chamber from an old project and I scrape that nice white layer of mold off. Now I'm going to dissolve that in some 110 degree water just like you're proofing yeast. You don't want that water to be too hot but you don't want it to be too cold either. You want to spur this, these uh, mold cells to grow and expand in that solution. I'm also going to add a little bit of dextrose to that and what that's going to do is give that mold something to feed on. Now when I put my products into the my curing chamber, I'll use just the regular misting spray bottle and I'm going to put a layer of mold on the outside. Now that does a similar thing to what our lactic acid starter culture is going to do, but that mold is going to feed on the sugars present on the outside or the initial layers of that sausage, creating more lactic acid, breaking those sugars down, making it safer to eat, again lowering the pH. Now if you think about historically why were we able as human beings to cure meat without these chemical compounds that we're now producing, these sodium nitrates and nitrites, well the first thing is they're naturally occurring in some salts. Um, you think about natron which is present, found around the world in natural deposits, it can, contains natu natural sodium nitrate. The other thing that we're talking about is the pH of the meat. Now you and me as human beings, or a cow as an animal, or a hog, they have a natural pH when they're alive of around 7. You know, that is the most stable, that's the most common, that's what water is at. Now that's also where bacteria is going to thrive. But if you think about when we slaughter an animal, what happens is lactic acid builds up in those muscles, lowering the natural pH of that cut of meat. Usually it's between 5.3 to 6.4, which makes it stable enough for us to just use curing salt. Now what we can do is, you can cure a sausage just using pure salt. There are recipes online for those. I would always recommend using that extra step of the salt cure number two. Now what that's going to do, as we've gone over before, is it's going to make that cellular level more inhospitable to bacterial growth. Now any of these ideas that I've gone over today, you can find different sources for them. Um, there are some really good sources that I have here. Jane Grayson has an excellent book on charcuterie. This one here is called Farm Meats. It's an old edition um, by M.D. Hessler, and this was used at Iowa State College as their textbook for many years. It has some great information. You can find a copy online on Google Books. And then also, you know, anyone who's watching this video probably has a copy of this book, and they contain some of the same information that I've gone over today. Now, another great resource that you can use is on Google Documents. It's called the Handbook of Meat and Meat Processing, the second edition. You can Google that, and it'll come right up, and that goes really in-depth into the science that I've gone over today. Again, I'm not a chemist. I'm a butcher. So if I've gone over something that you as a chemist think doesn't make sense, please post it in the comments, and let's get this clarified. Um, but I hope that helps you understand a little bit better the process that we're using in order to make sure that our sausages are eat, safe to eat. And the most important thing is to be comfortable and confident that your product is safe. If the mold doesn't look right, don't eat it. If it smells bad, don't eat it. If it's not cured entirely, if it's not firm to the touch, if it's still squishy, don't eat it. All of these things are explaining to you their natural warnings that your body has come up with to say, don't eat this product, and if you don't feel safe with it, just throw it away. We don't have a lot of money invested in these things, and your health is much more important than eating a bad salami. Now, the most important thing is, how am I going to be able to tell when my sausage is ready to eat? And what I do is a really basic principle. It's based off that same idea of water activity in the cell. I'm going to take my initial weight of my sausage when I put them in my cure chamber, and I record those on a little strip of uh, tape. I put that on each sausage and when I pull them out, I want to make sure that they weigh one third less than they went going into the curing chamber. That's a safe level. Now you're going to experience much more moisture loss than that. I usually experience between 40 and 50% moisture loss before I take my sausages out of the cure chamber and eat them. And now what I'm doing with that is I'm just ensuring that there's no free water in those cells for bacterial growth. Which is going to be making a shelf stable product, it's always going to make, be making it ready to eat, and safe to eat. So that's an easy way for you to calculate whether you're meeting these standards. Again, you can buy a paw kit, which measures water activity. You can send off for moisture protein testing, but these are more expensive alternatives to the more basic, 
you know, just using a proportion to make sure that when your sausage comes out, it weighs 30% less than when it goes in. Again, you'll be able to tell too, if it's squishy, if you can move your meat around, it's not ready. That means there's still too much water, still too much moisture inside those cells. Once they're dry, they will be hard and dry. That's why we call them dry salamis. So anyway, I hope this gives you a better introduction today on some of the chemistry. I know it's pretty in depth, but I hope that helps to explain and puts together some of the information that's floating out there on the web. So thank you so much for watching this video and I hope you're ready to start curing some of your own meats.